Perfect. Welcome all of you to the 37th live webinar on orthopedic principles. This time, our guest faculty is Dr. Vijay D. Shetty from Hiram Nandani Hospital, Mumbai, India. Dr. Shetty is Associate Editor of the Sikhart Open Access Journal. He's on the Editorial Board of HIP International Journal. He's also on the Editorial Board of Asian Journal of Arthroscopy. He's an examiner for the International Society Examinations. He's also Vice President of the Indian Association of Sports Medicine and the Secretary of the Indian Biological Orthopedic Society. Today, Dr. Shetty is going to enlighten us on the use of platelet-rich plasma in sports injuries. Over to you, Dr. Shetty. Thank you, Tej. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, uh, it's quite nice to speak uh, on a Sunday morning uh, during uh, these uh, um, very relaxed hours, I would say, and from the home environment. Uh, so I think there's no pressure on anything. Uh, this is just one topic and has, uh, as uh, Hitesh rightly pointed out, uh, this is uh, um, uh, one lecture at one time and so that people can actually concentrate on what's really happening. Now for some years, um, we have been talking about uh, platelet-rich plasma, use of platelet-rich plasma in orthopedic clinical practice. And uh, let me just, uh, just one minute, uh, bear with me. Uh, okay, so we are back on the screen. All right. So these are my disclosures before I um, start my uh, lecture. Um, uh, so when we talk about, I mean, platelet-rich plasma, as you all know, it comes under the category of autobiologic products in orthopedic clinical practice. Now, when you look at uh, orthopedic, uh, pro autobiologic products in general, um, there are two categories. There is um, organic autobiologic product and there is uh, synthetic uh, autobiologic product. And these are all in practice um, probably in the last 15 years or so. Uh, in most parts uh, of the world. Uh, when it comes to organic, I'm, I'm going to touch on one part of the orthobiologic product that's organic orthopedic, that's from within the body. Uh, so we have bone marrow aspirate concentrate, BMAC, quite famously known as. We have uh, mesenchymal stem cells. In the, we have a new name for it, uh, uh, signaling cells these days. And uh, and there is my favorite topic, which has been close to my heart, platelet-rich plasma. Uh, the purpose of this lecture is because, you know, I have been in this position for some time, uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's when somebody utters the word platelet-rich plasma, uh, we as orthopedic surgeons go into a wilderness, you know, basically looking at things like, oh, what's this and what's happening and what's the indication? As an orthopedic surgeon, can I start... Uh, doing this practice in my clinical practice, all those questions arise in my mind. And as I mentioned, orthopedic practice in general involves a lot of things. You look at uh, trauma, you look at uh, sports injuries, you like, look at uh, elective conditions and, and so many things. And PRP for some reason has been in use in almost all of them, including trauma, including uh, elective uh, conditions, and also in sports injuries. So let's just focus on sports injuries only today. So PRP, it's a, just a quick uh, basic science, um, a few slides, couple of slides. Uh, we all know it's a blood product and it is platelet rich plasma. We know there are platelets you know, when you do complete blood count and you know it's around two and 2.5 lakhs uh, per uh, cc uh, and when we look at platelet-rich plasma, we are talking about five times more. That's a recommended uh, concentrate concentration for the for a solution of PRP. So in the solution, we have platelets, we have growth factors, we got WBCs, white cell counts, we got red cell counts, and we got also this new kid in town. It's been very popular now in the last uh, three four years, which is called alpha two macroglobulin. Now, why I, this slide is so important for me and for all of us who are uh, looking at this slide is because we actually think that everything in a solution of platelet 
rich plasma is good for our body not right not quite right it's because you see on your left the slide shows that prp has several growth factors the whole gamut of this this full group of growth factors and then you look at them you analyze them then we know that some P, some of these factors are actually not good for us some of this especially in this slide this is also i inherited from jason dagu uh, from the us uh, uh, one of his lectures and it's uh, for me again this is also very important message so there we are not in uh, not everything in prp is good there are factors in white on your left which are good for the cartilage there are factors on your right in yellow which are bad for the cartilage we won't go into the details of this because it's not about talking about basic science today now before we start now let's focus on our clinic we have a sport injury patient and you are the top orthopedic surgeon the gentleman has come to you to discuss about prp let's start from there and i had actually very interesting uh, a uh, patient just before the lockdown came from a uh, north who's working in the army but arguably uh, the uh, kickbox champion uh, for country so he was brought by the army doctor and from the north uh, for this therapy of course by recommendation so when i start this is what i tell myself first the first line is so important please remember this prp is not my first line of treatment full stop do we don't even get that in the beginning okay so let's imagine this gentleman who's performing at the highest level possible has come to you he's been around to many sports injuries especially some people have advised in surgery some people have said okay you don't go and do the sports get back to your routine and start living life as normal but he's It's not keen is he doesn't want to uh, go for surgery so he had his non operative therapy we, you can call it the way you want you want to say non operative uh, uh, conservative or he had several um, other treatments like physiotherapy alternative medicine and all that he had and now we take him through the spectrum of this treatment for any sporting injury start with that and then you come down to operative um, option which is probably the last option and we don't know whether that operative option is also going to do good to that patient you cannot promise him and this is these are all elite athletes and they come to you with a lot of expectations and they just think that uh, i'll go to vijay shetty i'll do get my prp done i'm back in action well we want him to get it back to action we want him to do very best in his career but then when we offer this it's a problem and that's when you should be thinking about prp again it's not first line of treatment we've been through this we've been through several other options of therapies and before we go into the red zone here there is an orange zone we just just wait and see what can happen if we can consider prp now again okay let's decide we've decided we will try and do prp now we are again looking at sports injuries in general sports injuries in general remember okay and and i just want to drive home this message very very clearly if you look at an article a book chapter on prp you will get thoroughly confused as of today let me tell you there are so many articles so many book chapters coming out on prp and end of it we'll be saying which one should i use so for all practical this is not written in stone please remember that again for all practical purposes all practical purposes there are only two types of prps there is a white cell rich prp and there is a white cell poor prp forget about other things poor platelet uh, poor plasma purified prp uh, so many other growth factors but i think on the, this day and age if you are talking about prp in sporting injury i'm not talking about other just think about these two uh, classifications or these two type of preparations right now it is a very very big umbrella sporting injury you can start off with whatever head injury down to the toe injury i mean there are so many things abdominal injury and so many things that can happen in sports 
but as orthopedic surgeons and sports medicine surgeons or physicians, I personally feel these are the four or eight important conditions that today we'll be focusing on. I won't be able to touch on everything that's beyond the scope of this uh, lecture, but commonest sporting injuries that we'll look at today. So I am also telling you today that PRP is not just the primary indication or indication for some sporting injuries. PRP is also indicated in some of those sporting sports injury surgeries, post post injury surgeries, like ACL reconstruction, fracture non units but I won't be touching on that uh, as well today. Just to let you uh, give you some idea that it's also used in other uh, sporting injuries such as fractures and and post-surgery uh, situations. If you go into PubMed, this was a few days ago, uh, that you and you search the literature, platelet-rich plasma, you'll get about 12,000 citations. And you can just see um, it all started in 1954, very few publications, and then really picked up in the last decade. And this was 2019. On the peak, now we are like well, first quarter of 2020, which is supposed to go up. If it goes in the same uh, pattern, then you will probably find it somewhere here. Then you come down to PRP in orthopedics. Again, you know, the last decade has seen a number of publications. This is my favorite PRP in sports injuries. This is probably a very important slide in this. Uh, uh, presentation. Why I say this is because, you know, the beginning of 2000, year 2000 or 2002, 2003, 3, 4, there was some interest. And around 2009, 2010, actually people started doing PRP widely in the West. And uh, you, you may recall that in 2007, uh, the famous golfer uh, Tiger Wood was injected around that time by Dr. Alan Mishra, whom I went and met uh, in uh, in the states, and that's where I learned the, learned learned about um, platelet rich plasma use in, in in clinical practice in general, and I became the founder member of Biologic Orthopedic Society of the U.S. at that time, and it suddenly picked up. And in the year 2015, we had 55 publications on PRP alone in sports injuries, and 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 again it's picking up. Now, let's start with our ankle sprain that we mentioned. Ankle sprain is probably the commonest sporting injury. All of us at some point in our life will get ankle sprain. And if you go down, go down to the literature, about 15% of all sporting injuries are ankle-related injuries, ankle sprain. So there are two things here. Most ankle sprains are very, very mild or moderate, and people get back to sports without any problem within a few weeks and sometimes maybe uh, a month or so. Um, but what is important here is somebody who has been playing football and cricket, whether he can go back to sports immediately, early return after PRP, we have no clue. This is a very interesting uh, um, uh, finding going by the literature. I've done thorough search and uh, Dr. Gopalan himself is an evidence-based man. And uh, uh, you know, I, if there is anything else he has found, um, apart from this, I'll be most happy to share that uh, uh, with him. But, uh, 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 and what interesting uh, thing here is that there is no use of PRP in chronic ankle sprains. Remember, we're talking about somebody who's not got into uh, back to sports, even maybe after six months of, of injury. Very few people, but then there is no use. I mean, I don't think uh, the PRP has been used uh, um, you know, uh, in these situations um, more than indicated. And there are two uh, publications that I've cited here in the year again, 2015. So ankle sprain, very, very, uh, the, 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 the evidence is uh, not so strong, not so conclusive. The, the, the next uh, popular sporting injury that you see you come across is patellar tendinopathy. I mean, you, you may call it jumper's knee, or anything, but usually you see such sporting situations where there is pain at the origin of plantar tendon, at the inferior pole of the patella, inferior pole. 
And if you are really looking at use of PRP, especially in recalcitrant petal or tendinopathy, uh, obviously you would you would uh, like to do the in sport in people who are engaged in sports. You'll have to make make sure that their vitamin D and B12 levels are fine. And then uh, if you need, you probably go for an MRI scan and confirm the diagnosis that this is definitely a patellar tendinopathy, especially at the original origin of the patellar tendon. And then I looked at the use of PRP. Interestingly, uh, there are people who have used PRP, but the studies are talking about uh, comparing PRP to dry needling, comparing PRP to extracorporeal shortwave diathermy, uh, uh, sh shortwave therapy. And uh, um, so both studies are showing PRP is doing okay, but the study groups are very, very small. This is not a high quality evidence. So again, the, the jury is still out. Talking about Achilles tendinopathy, I'm doing a lecture next week on this one. Uh, and uh, again, I looked at uh, the literature, not so strong on the use of Achilles tendinopathy, PRP on Achilles tendinopathy. Rotator cuff, very interestingly. Um, I have used myself, but uh, I have about uh, 20 odd patients now, which we will uh, assess maybe uh, towards the end of this year uh, to check what's really happening. The, again, when you look at uh, the injection option for a rotator cuff, and you use the word tendinopathy, but in sporting, it's usually a small to medium to large uh, tear. Usually it's, it's a small to medium tear, um, restricting the athletes to get back to their uh, uh, sporting activities, especially, especially uh, cricketers, including bowlers. Uh, so uh, I looked at the, uh, uh, um, the literature. Um, there is no study so far. I'm going to go to take you to the next slide. Uh, there is no uh, studies uh, so far involving direction into the tendon. See, directly into the tendon because it's rem you remember most of us orthopedic surgeons, when we want to do an injection into a shoulder, nine out of 10 times, it's a subacromial space. It's subacromial space in that, and it's a blind injection. We don't know where is the tear. But in, in high, in elite athletes, maybe we have an, an MRI scan, we still do an injection into that spot. So we don't have that kind of a study where people have used PRP directly into the area of uh, injury. This is the um, um, paper I just read last week uh, and uh, the beginning of this week, in fact. Uh, so this is, I think, one of the first uh, level one studies of uh, late. Um, from Switzerland. Um, it's a multi-center study. Uh, if, uh, if efficacy of PRP for the treatment of, see, interstitial supraspinatus tears. We go back one slide. I was talking about no direct injection. And this is actually uh, uh, the paper that's describing uh, the procedure of PRP injection into the torn area of supraspinatus. And what, what is the conclusion? This is the double blind randomized controlled trial. Um, I think this is this is AJSM. Uh, I think the current AJSM has this paper if you want to see. Uh, so the conclusion is PRP injections within interstitial tears did not improve tendon healing or, or any outcome scores compared with cell line. So at least it's a compared with cell line injections. So which means we still don't have a concrete evidence on um, uh, the use of PRP in uh, rotator cuff tears. Plantar fasciitis, my favorite, Dr. Gopalan was one of those faculty members when we did our first uh, uh, meeting uh, in Mumbai 2012 and we published our results at the time and then later uh, we um, published in uh, Foot and Ankle Journal. And uh, uh, my favorite is whether if you're looking at um, a steroid injection, which has been a traditional way of treating uh, very severe, uh, painful, uh, recalcitrant plantar fasciitis, um, the other option of PRP is something to compare. And it, likewise, um, as appropriate, most studies that we look at today in the literature are comparing uh, plantar fasciitis to uh, steroid injections. And uh, obviously, the PRP group has been doing well, but we still don't have uh, one of those uh, level one studies on this. So if you're looking at uh, uh, tendo Achilles and patellar tendinopathy, probably we have uh, better support in literature wise 
on plant appreciators. This is our favorite, and that this is a very strong message, message that I want uh, to pass uh, to you all on is at the moment, we have the best evidence possible for tennis elbow. And again, going back to my first slide, not the first line of treatment, we're talking about recalcitrant uh, tennis elbow. And the PRP has done very well. We have Mishra's paper published six years ago, uh, and of late, there are a lot of papers coming out on the use of uh, uh, PRP in tennis elbow. Muscle injuries, uh, commonest sporting injury uh, in the West, uh, especially hamstrings in football, and uh, people are doing it. And uh, see, uh, there are three levels that hamstrings can get uh, injury, proximal attachment, distal attachment, and mid substance. Mid substance is the commonest uh, um, uh, injury, uh, hamstring injury, and people have been using PRP, but in, we are still having a problem in finding uh, uh, literature support, inconclusive uh, evidence for the use of PRP. I thought this is important for this topic because most people in sports, people who are in maybe 30s, would have had some injury to their cartilage in the past, in their late teens, 20s, uh, resulting in what is called cartilage damage um, uh, uh, leading to secondary boy. I'm not talking about uh, fully uh, established osteoarthritis in people who in 50s, 60s, 70s. This is a young generation and a lot of people are now using PRP on, on this. So let's just concentrate on this busy slide. Um, just ignore the slide, just follow my cursor. Now we have, these are the studies that have been looked at all level one except one in the year 2017. Okay, fine. What is important here is this: these are the level one or level two studies which uh, uh, looked at use of PRP in early OA in sporting uh, people. And forget about this one. I just want you to concentrate on type of PRP that is used in each study. See, this is leukocyte rich PRP. This is leuco. This is not recorded here. Uh, leukocyte poor PRP. You see, in the first uh, half of this, I mean, especially earlier studies, there were no concepts in the when you uh, when I started PRP in the year 2009. It's almost a decade. I had no idea what was uh, leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor uh, uh, PRP at that time. But now we are very very clear in our minds. And so you just look at the leukocyte rich PRP, leukocyte poor PRP, leukocyte poor PRP, leukocyte poor PRP. I reckon. All these non-recorded ones would have been leukocyte uh, uh, poor PRP at that time. Um, but having said that, you see the, uh, the outcome here, uh, which study has actually favored, uh, favored uh, PRP use? Leukocyte rich one, no. Okay, all these plus one, you see, they're all leukocyte poor. See, this is 12 months plus leukocyte poor plus leukocyte poor plus. What does this tell us? It just tells us that for intra-articular injections, leukocyte poor PRP is probably the ideal preparation. Then we looked at uh, auto evidence uh, uh, from uh, uh, Canada, uh, Mohit Bandar's group. They, they have uh, looked at um, 16 RCTs, level one studies, uh, evaluated the use of PRP. This is interesting here. Uh, they, what they have done is um, they have looked at the comparative uh, studies comparing PRP to placebo and uh, PRP to non-operative treatment, which is probably conservative method, PRP to steroid, PRP to hyaluronic acid, and PRP to surgery alone. I would have uh, thought that this is probably early osteoarthroscopic um, debridement uh, on uh, uh, early uh, OA of the knees. And if you see, large number of studies are um, comparing uh, PRP to the to uh, hyaluronic acid, viscose supplementation. So at three months and six months, the placebo group, okay, PRP did well with placebo group, PRP with non-operative, no significant difference at one year. I think this is important, the one year bit. PRP with hyaluronic acid, this is actually gaining momentum at this point. Uh, in fact, people have now come to a conclusion that we have to now 
mix PRP with visco supplementation, hoping that we'll get much better uh, results or outcomes. And PRP with surgery, arthroscopic uh, debridement, mostly, uh, again, no significant difference. So what does it tell? Uh, steroid, I mean, nobody has followed up for one year uh, in this group, but uh, what does it say? I think this is good, and PRP definitely works better uh, than placebo. And again, this is the beginning of, uh, uh, well, no, last month I picked up this article, uh, the latest uh, level one study. Uh, this is again from uh, Jason Dragu's team who's done excellent work on uh, PRP. Uh, you'll see a large number of publications under Dragu on PRP. Uh, so uh, they found 18 level one studies that met with inclusion criteria uh, and uh, uh, most of all of them, see, this is important. If you go back to the previous one, they were actually looking at uh, the comparatives as placebo operative and all that. But if you see here, they are all, because now the focus is on PRP versus visco supplementation at this point. The placebo is gone, steroid is not comparable, surgery no, no, um, and conservative treatments are also not comparable. So uh, now focus is on uh, PRP uh, versus visco supplementation. All level one studies, I think the most significant finding that they have found is that PRP group did definitely better looking at the outcomes, OMAC, IKDC, and pain scale. And, and this is also an inference conclusion from his study that leukocyte poor PRP has a superior performance. So I think when you look at, uh, you know, this is for the younger generation, whenever you want to start such a uh, treatment in your uh, clinical practice, you have to also, evidence is one thing, you will have to also, uh, literature is another thing, and you also have to look at the recommendation from uh, some uh, bodies, uh, uh, you know, uh, like we have this uh, nice uh, in the UK, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Now they call it slightly different, National in Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Uh, so, uh, so the latest recommendation is, this is for use of PRP in, in clinical practice. Safety, no major concerns, efficacy, um, questionable uh, than recommendation to be used with uh, fully informed consent. So, which means this for us, for us who are in practice, this means that we can consider PRP, but uh, we'll have to take the patient to, into confidence and talk to him or her about the do's and don'ts of taking the injection. Right, okay, in sports injuries, my favorite slide, Tennis elbow, safety, yes, efficacy, yes, number of studies, high quality, recommendations, yes. OA, I can now tell you again, it's high quality, okay? I think it's almost done. Dr. Dylan was talking in a conference um, uh, with me uh, towards the beginning of this week, and they, they uh, showed some beautiful uh, work that's going on in Chandigarh, um, in Jipit, in postgraduate institute and uh, um, you know there's more and more high quality evidence coming uh, on the use of prp especially in uh, early early oa patellar tendinopathy probably yes but with caution and plantar fasciitis personally if you ask me it's my favorite for those who keep coming to you with and who do not want the injection and who have been who have tried everything else see um and the second thing is, again, rotator cuff. The important bit is all of this, in all these conditions, we are being safe. We have to, well, I think, efficacy is uh, questionable in most of these, and we do not have high quality studies yet. Recommendations, yes, with informed consent. Right, okay, we're coming down to the, uh, the last slide of this lecture. Please remember this. This is for me the most important statement. It is not the first line of treatment. Safety, there is clear evidence in all conditions as you like. Efficacy, there are some conditions that are questionable. Um, you, as long as you use PRP with informed consent and you please use this on a patient who actually understands and accepts, which is very important, understands and accepts the benefits and the risk 
Of course, we don't have major adverse effects with PRP, but still they'll be spending money on the injection and procedure and so many things. And again, another take home message is leukocyte rich plasma. I said there are only two types. Leukocyte rich plasma is preferred uh, for soft tissue conditions. And if you want to do an injection into a joint, please go for leukocyte uh, poor PRP. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Vijay, that was a very splendid lecture. Thank you. You can you hear me, Vijay? I can, I can. Okay. I'll can go off the uh, Yeah, that is a fantastic lecture from your side. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come up in the chat box. Uh, we can discuss a few of them. First is regarding the uh, man, I mean the manufacturer of PRP. See, can we really do a simple one from our blood bank, take blood, send it for centrifugation, and take the supernatant? Don't you think that's a very simple, cost-effective method? Because I was discussing with Sandeep Patel the last day we hosted him for a webinar, and yeah. he said that he also does that. So don't you think that's a very simple, cost-effective method? Uh, yes, um, I, in, I I work in a very different atmosphere. Uh, so we I, when we started uh, PRP, we actually did that. And uh, uh, when I came back from the US, I uh, you know you met Suvin, uh, our pathologist, many times. So uh, so I spoke to him, and uh, you know what was happening is um, he was taking almost about 150 to 200 cc of blood. And then he would keep it in uh, in the freezer, and then uh, he would prepare the PRP. And what we did was then we tried to look at the platelet counts in each preparation. And what we realized um, that you know we end up uh, taking quite a lot of uh, blood, and we asked the patient again to come back. This is in 2009, uh, Hitesh, and come back. And we looked at several inconveniences that were caused. And at the same time, we had this Biomet and other companies coming in talking about uh, the new kits, which take only like 50 cc of blood or 60 cc, and you call the patient and you do it on in front of them, 15 minutes spinning, you give, do the injection, send them home. So it was a question of convenience for me. And that's how I started it. But theoretically speaking, it is still possible. And I think Chandigarh, they, they have another process. Maybe we should discuss with them because they are not only they're doing clinical studies, they're also engaged in preclinical studies. So I, and there are a lot of guinea pigs lying there and okay. doing, uh, they're doing this. Uh, no, the reason yeah. I ask is, see, uh, everyone does not work in the same setup. A large, I mean, you work in a corporate setup, 80% of orthopedic surgeons all over the world work in a different setup where we are looking at cost-effective methods. So you think that's an alternative, right? It is an alternative, definitely. You, you okay. will have, now, I mean, this day and age, We'll have to look at several things. You know, if you, as I mentioned, not everything in PRP is safe. I mentioned the type of preparation of PRP. If you keep all those things in mind, you get a good hematologist, discuss with him, and uh, uh, and you can, if you want to go on a large volume, I think uh, that's probably the best thing. Have uh, you, uh, did you, did you look at the, uh, just out of uh, context, look at the cost of collecting blood and preparing PRP? You know, Vijay, I've been, see, ever since I've attended the IBOM meeting with you as faculty in 2012, I've been using PRP the same way. I just do a customized one from our, my blood bank, but I don't do it for every condition because still we are I'm very about the shoulder. It does not work for shoulder pathology. Like you have rightly said, the evidence is not conclusive or evidence is limited for a shoulder pathology. But I personally feel, I mean, looking into all these evidence and also you need to add experience to that. For aculus tendinopathy, for patients with aculus tendinopathy, I've seen a very good result to the sense that I have patients being referred from neighboring districts to come to me for this because some people have advocated surgery and this simple cost-effective injection would cost just 500 rupees for the patient. And they are very yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I, I totally agree with you. I mean, we, unfortunately, we live in a world where uh, there are, you know, there are two sides of life. One is evidence, oh, no, no. other one, other one is eminence. And uh, <laughs> uh, I draw everybody's attention. I re I recommend that you read the latest 
article on author evidence on injection of steroid in ONEs. Beautiful article. Mohit Bandari and uh, Raman, uh, what's his name? And is one of your colleagues. Anyway, so beautiful article. It's on author evidence latest. You know, in the end, the, the question is, if I have my uncle or my, my in-law, anybody, uh, close relative in the late 70s, coming with acute knee pain, don't want an operation, don't want tablets, I will not hesitate to give a steroid injection. That is the beauty of that, that lecture. Same thing applies to here. Now, I mentioned to you that because, you see, that was the, my job to collect the evidence. Now, uh, I have three uh, patients who came from the Middle East who are, uh, you know, mountain climbers. They, they go over the weekend and all three had, came with the, an MRI uh, of showing mild to moderate uh, supraspinatus tear. They came specifically asking for uh, uh, PRP because they saw it on the web and everything. And after I, then I, I took them through the same, uh, you know, procedure and I told them, they said, no, they want to take it because they saw harm. All of them keep sending my their pictures going, doing hill climbing. They're very happy. But, you know, I, I, that's what I want to collect about 25, 30 uh, numbers and then maybe I'll write it up. But again, level of, uh, you know, level one evidence, meta-analysis, these are all things which sometimes we will have to follow. Uh, that is very important, especially for recommendations. So, but I, I totally agree. I have a few uh, long distance runners. We've got a big marathon team here in Powai and uh, running team. And uh, many of them are my patients. And I have done a few injections to tender Achilles. They're doing well. So that's uh, that's the beauty of practice. And I don't know how. Yeah. And yeah. The, other point, the other point is PRP works differently in different pathologies, right? For example, it right. doesn't work the same way as in the shoulder, as it works in the knee or it works in the heels. Because the pathology, primary pathology in these conditions are different. Isn't yeah. it? Yes, that's right. Why we have a heterogeneity of results. Yeah, there's so much happening. There's so much happening in, in still in, in pre-clinical studies, people are looking at the cartilage regeneration, looking at callus formation. I mean, I just read another article from China is actually bringing out so many of these animal studies now. And uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm only talking about the studies at the moment. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's difficult, but I, you're correct. There's a one slide from Jason Drago, which is clearly highlighted, you know, the yellow stuff whatever that is, it's supposed to be chondro, um, uh, uh, you know, it's dangerous for the cartilage. Uh, uh, and, and if you have to actually use them, what they recommend is you do an ELISA test and remove them. No, ELISA, something to do with ELISA test, remove those growth factors and then inject. So, I mean, that's a different type of preparation again. So I didn't want to confuse anybody. I mean, for us in clinical practice, if you're dealing with bone and joint or joints, PRP poor plasma, if you're doing, you're safe. Now, having said that, I we were in a meeting uh, again recently with the uh, Sachin Tapasvi uh, was doing from Pune, and uh, he he was talking about uh, um, you know PRP use post ACL recount and all that, and then he said he would like to do a PRP rich. I I asked this question with him, then he said Vijay, Vijay there are conflicting um, you know there is conflicting evidence, but he has seen some results, and in fact we have also written. A small article for Journal of Arth Arth Arthroscopy, Asian Journal of Arthroscopy, uh, on the same thing. So again, that is a separate type of preparation. And there are people using PRP on the peripheral rim of the meniscus nowadays, you know, um, uh, especially uh, when they want to do the peripheral rim repair. So there are indications fast. I mean, I show that graph. So I think, uh, so it's, it's, it's too confusing. So I just wanted to keep it very simple. Okay, Vijay, thank you. But I think the, there are no more questions and it was very enlightening. Uh, I mean, I'm, we have discussed PRP so many times, but every time we come online, we have something new to discuss. And this is really something that you have taken a lot of time to get a new perspective into PRP. Thank you so much, Vijay. And we look forward for more from you. Thank you, Vijay. Have a good Sunday. And all of you. Thank you. Yeah.